when I was uh, working with uh, Kevin Kohler at Fortuna, uh, who was he was here a couple years back at a revival. But uh, him, his son, uh, Todd Foreman, who was a pastor at the time in Versailles, and I don't remember the fourth guy. They had the Sweet Harmony Boys uh, Quartet, and um, uh, Kevin's wife, Sue, was in charge of the music for the Sweet Harmony Boys Quartet. And uh, anytime they were singing, what, what, you, what you started to realize is that everyone else's voices were quite a bit quieter than the sons. You really liked Matt's, uh, Matt's voice. So it, it was a quartet, but it was really starring Matt. So anyway, it's kind of a, it's kind of fun. Matt, uh, Kevin used to have to get on to his wife for that. He always had one, one mic considerably louder than the others. Uh, anyway, James chapter 1. That's where we're going to be this morning. James chapter 1. So we're, we're continuing this. We had studied James chapter 1. We read 1 through 8 last week. We're going to go ahead and re-read that, and we're going to conclude in chapter 12, or sorry, verse 12. And uh, we won't go over 1 through 4 again, but we'll focus on 5, uh, 5 through 12. And uh, so hopefully you guys have got your scriptures open there. This is what the scripture says. James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. To the twelve tribes, this first abroad, greetings. Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, he, he should ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and to all, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without doubting, for the doubter is like a surging sea, driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded and unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of humble circumstance boast in his exaltation, and let the rich boast in his humiliation, because he will pass away like a flower of the field. For the sun rises and, and together with the scorching wind dries up the grass, its flower falls off, and its beautiful appearance perishes. In the same way, the rich person will wither away while pursuing his activities. Blessed is the one who endures trials, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for this scripture. Lord, we ask as we study it this morning that your word, above all, be, be uh be heard. Lord, just come into our hearts. Name I pray. Amen. So we, we take a look at this, and, and uh, we spent all week last week doing verses uh, 1 through 4, so I don't want to go uh, back into that uh, too much, but when we come into verse 5, we need to at least have the context of 1 through 4 in our, in our brain. Remember, J uh, James has just instructed that we need to be happy, that we should, as it says, consider it a great joy when we go through different trials. Uh, and and he, he goes that when we, when we fulfill these trials, we will be more mature. Our faith will be better having gone through the trials. And the analogy that I try to use on that is would be similar to someone who's out, you know, lifting weights or running or preparing for an athletic, uh, some sort of athletic uh, uh, endeavor, because obviously that practice is what prepares you for that for that competition, and that's kind of the the, the, the analogy there. And he goes right into verse five and says, "Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God." Now, that seems kind of interesting, because uh, notice that James doesn't write, and, and, and as you study the book of James, and, and I really recommend you do this, I really recommend it's five chapters, you, if you read, you know, if, if you just challenge yourself to read one chapter a day, starting tomorrow, by the end of the week, you'll have completed the book of James. And when you read James, um, uh, what, what I get when I read it, is it's almost like a bullet point uh, 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 just different things. This is how you live a Christian life. Blah, 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 blah. Like it just shoots down. He does not give the stories that uh, someone like, say, Paul would write when he writes uh, there. So he just, he's just shooting all these kind of bullet points out. And so we go straight from this, hey, you know, we're going to suffer these trials, but you need to embrace the trials. You need to be not necessarily excited, but you need to be, you need to be uh, excited that you will 
that you will, at the conclusion of your trial, you will be stronger having dealt with it. And then he goes on with this concept of, of if you lack wisdom, you should ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to him. Now notice he does not say, raise your hand if you're not very wise. Right? Like, he wouldn't say that. He doesn't say uh, to the stupid people, to the whatever. He doesn't say that. He goes, if you are lacking wisdom, there's not a single person that I can imagine who would ever say, I've got all the wisdom I need. I'm about as wise as you can be. You see, anyone who would, who would hear that first part, if you lack wisdom, you go, man, I need more wisdom. Now, one of the things that we need to worry about, one of the things that we need to figure out in our, in, in, in our culture, in our church today, is wisdom is infinitely different than knowledge. I can send my children to school. I can send my, you know, one day when my children, you know, get old enough and they decide maybe they want to go to university, I can send them off to college. I can, I can send them all these places. Man, I can give them books and we can learn facts and they can learn all these things and they will have knowledge. They will have intelligence. But none of that is directly relational to wisdom. In fact, I think if you look around in the, in, 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 on the news and the culture today, you will see a definite lack of wisdom. The key difference between wisdom and knowledge, knowledge is simply knowing the facts, knowing, you know, the earth spins 24 hours in a day, all that kind of stuff. That's all knowledge, and that's well and good. Wisdom is having the ability to see a situation and not react viscerally, not react purely on your emotions, but to be able to sit back and say, let's think about this. Let's come to a logical, good conclusion after we have considered the facts. Now, one of the things that I, I would like to challenge you, and again, I, I, I feel like I'm doing this more now than I ever did uh, before as part, of the, as part of just what's going on here in our, in, in our society right now. But, but we need to strive for wisdom. All right? When, when, when we see a video on TV... When we see a video on our news feed in, in, in Facebook, when we see a video or whatever, and it makes you want to get mad, one of the things that we need to do is go, you know what, let's not react. Maybe let's slow down a little bit. Let's, let's focus on this. Let's look at the, let, let, let's try to pursue wisdom. Let's try to be wise. I will give you a, a, a quick hint. Someone who acts in anger, someone who reacts with emotion, Generally is the void of wisdom because what I've noticed in my life and again This is this is me just talking to myself here uh, What I've noticed in my life is anytime I react with my anger or react with my emotion The whole wisdom thing it goes out the door and that night or two nights later or two weeks later or something else I'll be going to bed and I'll be replaying that scenario and I'll say to myself man I wish I would have done that differently. I wish I would have handled that situation differently. And the way we get wisdom is the next time a similar situation happens that we, that we check ourselves and go, wait a minute, I've done this mistake before. That's, maybe that's those previous trials. That's how that happens. Look, wisdom is something that God gives for us. And, and especially, remember, James is writing this, and his intent is to a very Jewish uh, uh, audience. Now, of course, it's appropriate to all of us today. But he is saying, if you lack wisdom, you should ask God. Well, of course, if you're a Jew, you know, you, you, you know all about this. Remember, King David, great, great king, set up all these things. Well, his son that comes after him, the son that becomes king after him, is King Solomon. And when King Solomon becomes king, there's a, and, and there is a predecessor here. It does say that King Solomon loved God, which is, which is a very important uh, predecessor. But he was, he was uh, they're doing an offering and stuff. And it says that the Lord spoke to King Solomon. You'll see this in, in, in uh, the book of 1 Kings chapter 3. This is kind of when this happens. But 1 Kings chapter 3, and, and the Lord says to King Solomon, he goes, Ask for whatever you want, and it will be granted. And King Solomon doesn't say, well, I need more money. I never want the country to run out of money. He doesn't say, I need a good army. I never want the country to run out of uh, the ability to defend themselves. He, never, he, he didn't say any of that. He didn't say, I need good land so that the, the, the country can, can feed itself. All things that would probably be a, somewhat appropriate for a king. He goes, Lord, 
Give me wisdom. Allow me to discern evil from right. And God says to him, and, and, and the, the scripture, the Lord says to him, because you have asked for this, it will be given to you. Because you didn't ask it for your own selfish ambitions, you asked it to better serve my people. See, that's the context which every Jew would have known. That's the context which every Jew would have known. So when, when, when James writes out in John, uh, James chapter 1, verse 5, when it says, Now if you lack wisdom, you should ask God, and he gives them to all who generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to him. Every person who, who, who grew up in, through Jewish synagogue, through Jewish education, would listen to that and go, just like Solomon. This isn't news. This isn't a, this isn't a, a new thing. This is very much... Uh, kind of uh, repetition. And that promise is still true to us today. That we, we go to, a, to go to our Lord in prayer and we ask God, please give me wisdom. I don't know how many times I've had the conversation with a, with a Christian brother or sister. And we talk about things and, 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 uh, and, and, and it always comes up and, and uh, again, this is your pastor speaking here just for a second, but uh, we'll be like, hey, I, I've been dealing with this uh, frustration, I've been dealing with that, and one of my friends will say, well, when was the last time you prayed about it? Now, my, my heart is like, shut your mouth, you know, because that's, you know, that's what I want to say to him. I was like, just, dude, I got this. But oftentimes, if I'm being honest with myself, I'll go, hmm, I don't think I've prayed enough. Or maybe I haven't prayed at all about that. Maybe my prayers have been just general. Lord, help the church. Lord, help such and such. But I, but I, didn't, I didn't go to God in a very uh, specific way and say, Lord, help this particular person in this particular issue, this very specific set of circumstances. I, I just, I just, I kind of fall into like a uh, kind of a grayscale, if you will, in my prayer. Remember what Jesus did, like when he tells us how to pray, when he tells us how to do that, when he is, when he is there in the Garden of Gethsemane and and and, uh, and 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 John gets to write down that prayer. He says, "Lord, I don't want this. I don't want this to happen. But it's not my will, but yours." And we get to see Jesus talking to his dad, talking to the Father, just in the in the exact same way that you and I get to talk to him, uh, to talk to God in our life today. He's he's had that same conversation, and he and he and he gives them very very specific prayer: be with my, be with the followers, be with them, let them be strong. It's not just grayscale. It's not it's not like the Miss America pageant, and I don't even know if they have a Miss America pageant anymore. But it's, it's probably it's probably illegal in some capacity now. But but in any case, um, <laughs> but if they ask that, they always say like, uh, "We want to, uh, to feed the world," you know. And it's always just kind of it's just, it's just very mundane. Yeah, it sounds good, but there's no real practical issue with it. Make sure with our prayers that we pray very specific prayer, that we ask God, that we, we tell him, that we say, God, I need wisdom in this situation. I need wisdom in raising my children. I need wisdom in handling you know, some of the stuff that I've got going on at work. I need wisdom in how to... Uh, to help the, the, the local school in this time and, 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 and when to say what and how to support the teachers or whatever. Let's be very specific with our requests to God. And notice, and then he goes on to verse 6 and 7. And I don't know about you all, but 6 and 7 to me, they kind of hit me like a train wreck. Like, everything's going pretty good until you hit verse 6 and 7. Everything's going really well, actually. When you look at what, what James is saying, he's like, hey, man, you got a problem. Be excited about it. You know, it's your opportunity. I, my, my boss tells me this all the time. He goes, Andrew, we don't have problems here. We have opportunities. And I, and I finally got to tell him, my boss, I said, boss, I want a job with a lot less opportunity. You know what I mean? I, I'm like, I'm done with this. But that's what my boss is. And, so, uh, and so that's what James is saying. He said, hey, we... Be, be excited about the issues. Be excited about these deals. They're going to produce endurance, and endurance is going to complete itself. You're going to be lacking nothing. If you are lacking some wisdom, pray. God will give it to you. And then he hits you with verse 6. But let him ask in faith without doubting. For the doubter is like a surging sea, driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded and unstable in all his ways. That's a tough bit of scripture. That's a hard thing to read. That's a hard thing to, 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 to pick up on face value. That, that's, that's downright scary. 
Because I can tell you uh, from my own personal experience, it's all the experience I can really speak of, but, but whenever I pray, whenever I go to sleep at night, and I've shared this with you, that I have doubt, right? That I have concern, that occasionally, that I will go to the, go to the Lord and I'm like, God, man, I don't understand this. Or is this really what you have me to do? Are you really listening to my prayer? Am I really saved by your grace? Like these are all doubts that come into my heart at different times. These are all doubts that happen to me. And so whenever I go through this and I look at the let him ask in faith without doubting, I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm the king of doubt. Like I, I do this all the time. I doubt for the sake of doubt. I doubt the fact that I doubt. Right? Like, like I just, I, it gets scary. But this is where the knowledge part comes in. This is where the, the understanding of the scripture comes in. This is where understanding the principles and, and, and who God is comes in. See, I'm taken back to Mark chapter 9. In Mark chapter 9, we have Jesus, and, he, and you guys know the story. Jesus, and he meets a man, he goes, uh, your son is healed. If only you have faith. And, and, the, and the son was sick, and yes, he leaves, and, and the, they meet him halfway there. That's the story. But the man, the man makes a statement there. And this statement is something, this is a prayer that I pray more times than I can count. But the man says, Lord, I believe you. Help my unbelief. This guy just had his child healed by Jesus. And Jesus' response to him is, you just got to believe and, and, and the guy's like, I, I want to believe. Help me believe. And that's probably our prayer more than we care to admit. That's got to be our prayer more than, than and, and we've got to strip off the bravado, strip off the, I'm a pastor and I do this stuff and all that kind of junk. Or I go to church. Or, I've been raised in church since I was this old or whatever the case is. We've got to strip all that off and actually look at God and say, God, help my unbelief. Help me love you. You see, whenever I look at verses 6, 7, and 8, when, 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 we, when, we, when we take a look at that, it says, For the doubter is like the surge you see, driven and tossed by the wind. The person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. This, 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 this doubt is a little more so than just doubting the existence, doubting that. It's someone who is asking for the purpose of their own benefit. And James tells us this later on in chapter 4. And again, this is... It, it, it's, not trying to knock the writing style here or anything, but it's but when we read the book of James, it's really like just bullet point after bullet point, and, and, and we try to put it together in a in a uh, in a neat uh, uh, letter. But whenever we read this, look what he says in chapter four. He says, "You adulterous people, you do not do you not know that the friendship of the world is hostility to God. So whoever wants to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God." You see, he tells us, he tells us that, listen, if you are not, if you are asking in this concept that I just want it because I need it, Jesus himself says you're an adulterous people, an adulterous generation. You ask with evil intentions. See, that's the doubt that we're talking about. Is it, are, are, are we doubting, are we doubting that Jesus himself is the son of God? Are we doubting our ability to help him? See, in verse 8, I think it clears it up. For the doubters like a surging sea, driven and tossed by the wind. They're just chasing whatever. They're chasing whatever the wind blows at them. They're chasing whatever, whatever, that they, whatever they need to, uh, to, to chase, whatever fulfills them. And we have seen people time and time and time again in the ministry. There's another uh, terrible example again in the, in the news uh, just this week where, uh, where a famous uh, church leader, pastor, has, has yet again had a, had a, had a pretty substantial uh, falling out, and I and, and I, I, man, I pray constantly. I just talked to one of my one of my friends at work, who's also a, a deacon at his church, and I was just saying, man, I I pray constantly that I guard my heart because I, man, the difference between that person and me is that they just simply fell in temptation. But they just they, they simply they let their guard down. Maybe a maybe a one time thing. Maybe over over a long time of, of chipping away at their guard or whatever the case is. But they, they finally stumbled. And because they were so much more popular than me, and they're so much more uh, famous than me, and, and 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 they were put up on this pedestal, that the whole world gets to watch them come crumbling down. 
Guys, each and every one of us, we need to be careful. We need to guard our heart. We need to ask the Lord for wisdom. We need to check our doubt. That's that's not just a, that's not just the the doubt of uh, of what you do. And remember, Peter himself, Peter himself, in the presence of God, said, "I don't know who that guy is. I don't know who that is. In fact, those guys are a bunch of crazy people." While he's while he's out there uh, during the uh, during the trial, while he's sitting there keeping his hands warm by the fire, denied him three times. Would you say that guy had doubt? Well, Jesus, Jesus himself comes back and says, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Just like Matt said there and when we were doing the 23rd Psalm. You see, until we take our lives and we say, you know what, God? You have control. You have control. And you will lead me. You will guide me. You will, you will, you will carry me through this trial, this, this storm, this whatever it is. That's the wisdom that's produced. Looking on there at verse 9. It says, let the brother of humble circumstances, depending on your translation, you may, it may say, let the poor brother or let the rich, uh, depending on when it says humble circumstance or, 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 or rich. But it's, 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 again, read 9 through 11 again. It is not at all saying it is a sin to be rich and you are somehow glorified to be poor. That's not what the scripture is saying whatsoever. That's not, that's not at all what it's saying. It's saying, let the brother of humble circumstance exalt in his, or sorry, boast in his exaltation. That means it doesn't matter how poor you are, you're going to say, hey man, I am saved by the grace of God. I am saved. I don't care how much money's in the bank account. I am saved and I will proclaim the saving grace as for as many as can hear. And then in verse 2 it says, but let the rich boast in humiliation because he, he will pass away like a flower uh, in the field. That's not, that's not a curse on the rich person by any means. But it's a person who has a lot of money, maybe a person who's got a lot of whatever. And they say, you know what? It doesn't matter all about all that, man. I am here to glorify God. And one day it's all going to go away. It's all going to go away. My dad, my grandfather once got, uh, and, and, and I may have shared this story before, but my, my grandfather one time just really annoyed uh, a particularly large personality there in Tipton, um, uh, someone who had just a, a tremendous amount of land and liked to, liked to let you know just kind of how much money and stuff they had. And, and, uh, and he was kind of giving my grandfather a hard time one day at the coffee shop. And, and my grandfather said, you know what, buddy, you and I, we're going we're gonna to own the same amount of land someday. And the guy goes, no, there's no way. Man, I, I couldn't give away enough land until I finally had as little as you. He goes, oh, no, we're going to have that much land the same day. One day, we're going to have the same amount. One day, you and I are both going to have about six feet. And they said the guy got so mad, he got up and walked out of the coffee shop. He couldn't handle it. <laughs> Guys, we got to understand that if you've been blessed, that's awesome, man. Be happy in your blessing. But let's not forget, you didn't earn it. Like you, you, you may have done some good stuff, you may have done whatever, but, but, but we are here as a result of what God has done for us because he has shown favor on us. I have, very few times have I had the opportunity to meet with an individual from another country. Especially someone from, you know, some, some of the, the very poor countries in Africa. But one time, one, one, one such an event had happened where I got a chance to meet them. And this person was almost angry with Americans. They were almost angry. And I could only imagine how they would have felt like that. Because in this person's country, you might get one meal a day. Like you've got to figure out how to eat enough in one meal and then you're, you're done for the next. And, 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 and when, when, with the people he was staying with, with the people that he was interacting with, I mean, they were eating, obviously, a, it, it happens when you have guests coming in. Obviously, you have a big breakfast because you've got a guest and you eat a nice lunch because you're going out somewhere and then you eat a nice dinner. And, 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 and this individual is so frustrated. He goes, I can't, you guys throw away more food than, 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 than I get to eat in a week. And one day you throw away more food than I get to eat in a week. And he got very angry. And that's, you know, that's a bad deal. And, and, and don't get me wrong, I don't, I don't know how to fix that. I don't, no idea. But whether we have a lot or we have a little, and we have to be very careful with that. Because when we say, well, I just don't have as much. If you're living in America, if you have the fact that you can drink water out of your, you know, out of the tap, that you can, that you can, uh, that you have food, that you are not in a, a, a what is called a food insecurity, you know, you, you know where that's coming from, man, you are so, so amazingly wealthy. We don't boast in that wealth. 
We both say, you know, God has been good to me. Because that's what he's saying here. He says, that beautiful appearance is going to perish in the same way the rich person will wither away while pursuing his activities. If, you're de- if, if you are deriving your, your view of self-worth on what you've accomplished, you're going to become incredibly insulted someday. Because someday it's going to fall apart. But if we, do, if we, if we value our self-worth on what Jesus did for us, that's, it endures, and that's what it says in verse 12. Blessed are the one who endures trials, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Notice in verse 12, he comes right back into what we were talking about last week in those, in those first four verses, talking about those trials. He, he kind of went on this derivation, asking for wisdom and not being proud in our, in our situation and all that kind of stuff. But, but here, he's saying that, listen, you, you, you see it to the end, you get the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Because I don't know what you're going through today. I know for a fact that I have taken great, great pride in our church family. That you got, man, this is awesome. And as I got a chance to talk to Steve on Monday and, 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 and they shared some stories and stuff and, and just how much this family loves one another, We shouldn't boast in that necessarily. We shouldn't boast anything other than that that's what God has given us, that he has loved us in such a way that we can do that for one another. But guys, whatever you are doing, let's pursue that greater thing. Let's ask God for wisdom if we need it. And believe me, we need wisdom in, uh, We need wisdom today we've always had. So whatever your situation, whatever you are this morning, I invite you in this time. If you don't you've never admit, uh, uh, confessed your love for God, if you've never uh, offered him your life, we certainly invite you at this time. We'll stand and we'll sing. Uh...